Jenna Ingle loves the oboe. She has built her business on providing high-quality, handmade reeds, education, and a sympathetic ear to oboists across the country. When you order from Jenna Ingle Reeds, you get prompt communication, reeds or cane handcrafted to your specifications, and cheerful, friendly customer service. All orders are mailed within one week, sometimes much faster. Single orders or monthly read subscriptions are welcome, and she'll work with you to find the combination of response, resistance, stability, and flexibility that is right for you. Janet doesn't just do reads either. Look at JennaIngle.com for a selection of read cases, swabs, and tools, or for read making videos, classes, and boot camps. Podcast listeners can use the code DISH for 10% off their first order. That's DISH, all caps, at JennaIngle.com. Hey, oboists. Have you ever found it difficult to sort out when and how to find a new oboe or English horn? Oboe Chicago streamlines the process, providing personal and professional consultation and a large selection of lovely instruments. The process feels comfortable and thorough. Selection includes F. Loray of Paris, Howarth of London, Covey Oboes, and Fox Products. For a current listing of Oboe Chicago's selection, please visit www.oboechicago.com. For a credit of $100 toward shipping, mention Double Read Dish when you call or email Shauna. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Jackie. Hey, Kali. How's it going? It feels like forever since we've done this, but it hasn't been. It just feels like a lot has transpired since then, and it has. Yes, definitely. And we have planned a really special dish. You know, if you're listening to this episode sometime in the future, 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 this is... June 15th, 2020, where we are in the middle of a huge awakening, reawakening. Self-assessment. Self-assessment about race relations in the United States. And of course, that spills over into the arts. Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to talk about how we can add to this conversation in a meaningful way without just, you know, saying things. We also want to uplift the voices in our communities who have already been tackling these issues. I I loved your word awakening. A a lot of people are thinking about certain aspects of classical music and and what we do in a new way for the first time. And I've seen several times on social media, you know, people excited and saying, we need to start a discussion or, you know, uh, we we need to start to think about this. And uh, I think it's really important to point out that uh, nothing needs to be started. And in fact, (laughs) there are a number of black musicians in the classical community who have been having this conversation for years. And there are hours upon hours and pages upon pages and websites upon websites of content specifically geared toward the thing that people are just starting to think about now. Some people, you know, are just starting to think about now. So the first thing I think to understand is that um, just because certain conversations are timely uh, does not mean that these topics have not been being covered regularly and expertly by people in and out of the classical community for years. And so, absolutely, you know, you need to go and check out some of these resources because they're just phenomenal. Uh, so the first one that we want to talk about is actually hosted, co-hosted by a bassoonist, Garrett McQueen, and he is the host of the Triloquy podcast. This is a podcast that started in the summer of 2016. Garrett made the intentional shift from a career exclusively focused on bassooning to creating content. And much of the content specifically surrounding race, inclusion, real conversation, representation, all of these things that are fresh on our mind. Uh, Garrett is 
tackling on Triloquy and in other uh, radio shows that he's a part of. What did you think of Triloquy? Well, I really love this podcast and I especially love the interaction between Garrett and his co-host Scott Blankenship. It's a really friendly, fun atmosphere and they have a great rapport. They, you know, tackle topics like what it's like to be the only person of color in the room, whether it's on the classical stage or, you know, in a university. I also love that Triloquy invites guests from all parts of their career. So you'll have very established professionals and then you'll also have student perspectives and you have in Garrett the perspective of someone who has kind of lived both in and outside of the classical world professionally and that gives a very unique perspective. So yeah, it's uh, just, it's fantastic and really, really well done. The next podcast on our list is called The Score, an urban music education podcast. And it's hosted by Eric and Justin, two people of color who are also music educators. And um, they provide tips and strategies through honest discussions about their experience teaching music in an urban setting. And this is just a wonderful perspective about what it means to show up for your students, regardless of where they come from. So that is a really fascinating listen also. Yeah, you know, the thing I love about this podcast is a a lot of the ones that we're talking about today, well, all the ones that we're talking about today are hosted by people of color and they present that lived experience. And what Eric and Justin do is they are also teachers of music. Mm -hmm. And so you relate to them on multiple levels in in terms of that. You get the perspective of them, the individual, and then you get the perspective of them, the advocates for the students that they work with and care about. And so I found that the conversations were really nuanced. I was really inspired as a teacher in terms of utilizing this resource in my everyday life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the next one that we have is the Classically Black podcast hosted by Delaney and Katie, two string students studying at Eastman. They, number one, have so much fun on this podcast and they talk about coming up in the classical string scene um, from their different backgrounds and they manage to touch on a lot of heavy topics in a really fun way. They just seem like really fun people to hang around. Yeah, this podcast has so much joy. Oh, yeah. If you like Double Read Dish, which we assume <laughs> you do because you're less than I am right now, you will like Classically Black because it, it's basically the same thing. It's two girlfriends chatting about something that they very much care about, about something that they're very much knowledgeable about, but having fun in the process and it feels organic and it feels authentic because it is. Yeah, I just want to have them over for dinner and <laughs> listen to them talk. <laughs> I know. I hope they'll let us in their click. <laughs> the last podcast we have for you is called Melanated Moments in Classical Music. And this one is, the episodes are a lot shorter. They're little bite-sized 15 to 30 minute episodes. And it's hosted by international opera soprano Angela Brown and music sociologist Joshua Thompson. And they shine a spotlight on musical works composed by, for, and about people of color. And it's beautifully produced. They have some wonderful musical excerpts included, and they just have such a lively, involved talk about all of these different composers and styles and it's it's beautifully done and it's a joy to listen to yeah if you found yourself at all going well that sounds great but i don't know any black composers and i don't know where to start well we have the podcast for you i don't have the time yes you do they've made it very short they've made it very easy just click subscribe and you will you know learn about new works new things to, to be clear, the reason we're putting all these podcasts on your radar and resources is the first step is to just listen, to learn, to familiarize yourself with the, the resources and the history and the, the people who have done this before you, the people who are creating content. It's important to listen and familiarize yourselves with it. That then leads us to 
the question of, of once we have educated ourselves about a topic to connect that to action. So one thing I like to do to hold myself accountable is ask this question, who is in the room? And this allows us to really do some self-assessment at a micro and macro level. So we can think of that question literally, who's in the room? Look around when you're in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Look at your audience, look at your colleagues and ask yourself what you can do about that. And that may feel insurmountable, but there are ways that we can look at who's in the room and understand that we are in control of certain decisions. So when you're programming a recital, ask yourself, who's in the room or who's on the stand? Is there an opportunity to invite underrepresented people into this space? When you're making your syllabi, I taught classes where I was very proud of how diverse they were. And then I would say to myself, oh, you know, too bad I can't do that with Age of Beethoven. And this week I found myself saying, Jackie, shame on you. Yes, you can ask yourself who's in the room in terms of Age of Beethoven. You can look at what scholars you're assigning. You know, whose books are you putting on the syllabus? Whose articles? And if mm -hmm. that can't be as diverse as you would like, the videos that you play in class, who's on the stage that you're showing your students? You know, there is always some level that we can go to. And if we only think about the gigantic picture, we can stay in a comfortable place of telling ourselves we don't have the power to make change. But if you force yourself to look at even the smallest level, we actually have control of a lot. You know, the other thing that's been very beneficial to both of us is who's in the room in terms of, of the media that we consume. That's right. And that, that, that doesn't do, just have to be in terms of classical music, but the podcasts that we listen to, books that we read, or the albums that we listen to, you can ask yourself who's in the room in terms of that as well. The talent is out there. The resources are out there. Tiny steps are better than no steps. And it's humbling, but it's worth it. We need more diverse perspectives and we need to enrich what we do with the perspectives of all kinds of different people. So it's absolutely worthwhile to see in what small or big ways you can make a difference. And that might be completely new to you. And that might make you feel kind of uncomfortable and a little nervous about what if I do it in the wrong way? You make it sound so easy. I've never done anything like this before. And I'm so, so afraid to do it wrong, which I completely understand. And the last thing we want to touch on is something from the Learning to Listen panel it's this group of Black classical musicians talking about their lived experience and perspectives. And as we were watching that, we were actually kind of like <laughs> live texting it as we were yeah. watching with each other, loving it. And one of the final things that was said by one of the panelists, Randall Goosby. I guess the future that I envision is one where people prioritize doing what's right uh, over doing what's convenient and what's easy. Um, no one, I, you know, I, I hope that in the future, no one's afraid to stand up for what's right. No one's afraid to hold, the, hold those accountable, uh, including and especially those that they love and care about. Uh, and no one is afraid of being wrong. You know, as musicians, um, we understand perhaps better than most um, that fear of being wrong, of going on stage and missing a note or having a memory slip uh, or making any sort of mistake at all. Uh, but that fear never stops us from going on stage and playing our hearts out and, and speaking to our truth. Um, I just hope that in the future, people don't so easily allow their fear uh, of getting it wrong to deter them from doing what's right and saying it, even if it's wrong. Allow yourself to be corrected uh, and, to be, and to be educated on what is right. It really speaks to a growth mindset and being willing to be wrong and being willing to be humble you know, like every one of us is going to be wrong sometimes, but what's more important is to be open to critique, to be open to improvement and to listen and respond with humility. I love that Randall pointed out that that mindset is inherent mm -hmm. to who we are as musicians. So we should not fear it and we shouldn't shy away from it. We should embrace it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just thought that was so so well said. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
Ugly Duckling Oboes is dedicated to the development of young oboe players. They provide quality handmade oboe reeds, private lessons, and high quality oboe sales, rentals, and consignments. The oboes that they rent are conservatory mechanism oboes that include the left hand F key and low B flat key. All are maintained by oboe specific technicians. In person lessons are available as well as virtual lessons for students who live outside the geographic area or have transportation or schedule challenges. They also offer online college audition coaching for high school juniors and seniors who plan to audition to be music majors. Visit uglyducklingoboes.com for more details on how you can set yourself up for success and sign up for their newsletter. Thank you for your support, Ugly Duckling Oboes. Chemical City Double Reeds is a full service double reed shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Reed Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH, all caps, no spaces. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at chemicalcityreads.com. We are delighted to welcome to Double Reed Dish, Jonathan Kelly, Principal Oboe of the Berlin Philharmonic. Welcome. Thank you. We love to get to know our guests by having them tell us how they began to play their instrument, what made them choose it. So how did you get started on the oboe? I started the oboe when I was about 11 years old, um, when I went to high school, actually. They had in those days a system where anyone could start learning a woodwind instrument um, and have lessons for free. I don't think they have a system like that anymore, but um, I was already playing the piano. And then my teacher said to me, oh, you, you're allowed to pick a woodwind instrument. What would you like? And so I thought, well, uh, what is that? A clarinet or flute? I don't know. But my dad chose the oboe for me. He loved the oboe. And uh, so he encouraged me to, to um, pick up the oboe. And it was interesting, I took to it quite quickly, although um, several years before, I'd started, you know, recorder like everyone does in um, uh, primary school, what do you call that? Not primary, elementary school. And uh, I was really bad, really bad <laughs> at it. Um, and the teacher just encouraged me to stop because he said to my parents, <gasps> I was unmusical. Oh, no. but, the, uh, but actually he was right. I hated it and I didn't enjoy playing it. It didn't sound good. And so at the age of six, my musical career was potentially already at an end. But then um, with this opportunity at the age of 11 to, to, you know, to start learning, then I, I took the oboe and I took to it pretty fast. Yeah, so that's, that's how I got started. Yeah. And my teacher, my first oboe teacher was actually a clarinetist who demonstrated on the flute because he didn't want to have to transpose. So, so he didn't know, he didn't, I mean, by his own admission, he was a lovely man. He didn't know much about the oboe at all. And after about six or seven months, or maybe it was longer than that, I can't remember, of me sort of squawking down um, the instrument, he, um, he got a, a girl who was about, oh, she must have been about 17 or 18 um, from the local sort of music school to, to come and give me a, you know, a specialist oboe lesson. And uh, I remember she said, you know, I played her, whatever it was, home on the range, but they're really squawky. And she, um, she just said to me, why don't you just not blow so hard? <laughs> and uh, I went home that evening and I took the oboe out of the box again and, and demonstrated to my mum in the kitchen. Because I always used to practice in the kitchen because the acoustic was good. And my mum turned around and she said, oh my God, that actually sounds really nice now. And it was just because... <laughs> I'd stopped blowing so hard. And I think actually really just by hearing her demonstrate, it made me realize, oh, okay, that's how I'm supposed to approach the instrument. And, and then I, I really took off from then. Oh, the gentle insult of a mother. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose it was really. I think she was trying to be encouraging. <laughs> um, what happened after that? How did you get on the track of becoming a professional oboist? Well, um, so I stayed uh, just having these quite basic lessons, probably for about a year or so until they established that I had, you know, some talent and encouraged me then to go to 
the sort of local county uh, music school for my lessons. And I was very fortunate. I had a wonderful teacher from, from then on called Helen Armstrong. And she was, oh, she was like your sort of typical uh, English, uh, well, do you know Agatha Christie, Miss Marple? Mm-hmm. The detective lady sort of um, in sort of tweed and and just very sort of very English. And she was um, just a lovely, lovely lady. She, from day one, talked about line and um, singing with the instrument. And really, that's what she concentrated on for, for most of my lessons. She was uh, actually a very um, sensible and encouraging person. Her, her father was Sir Thomas Armstrong, who was the principal well, retired by that stage, but principal of the Royal Academy of Music. And one day she um, asked me to play to him when I was probably about 15 or so. And I was champing at the bit at that time to do lots of competitions and really get out there. And um, he, Sir Thomas Armstrong, gave my parents um, the advice that I should not try and push myself in terms of competitions and all that sort of thing too soon, but instead play lots of um, chamber music with really good string players and he said just to, he said just make sure that um, he's surrounded by good other good musicians and uh, and he'll be fine but but not to you know trying to push yourself before you're ready to you know to go on these TV competitions and all that sort of thing which nowadays is so popular and so I, I didn't I didn't do anything any of those sort of competitions and I I, I did instead um, plenty of chamber music and um, lots of orchestral playing. And then I, I didn't even go to music college. I went to university and did a history degree, but at the same time playing lots and lots of concerts. And from there, then I went to the Royal Academy and then the Paris Conservatoire. And then I became an oboist. So that's how I got there. When we announced that you were going to be on the podcast, we had a lot of listener question submissions. So we'll be sprinkling those throughout our talk. And Isaiah wants to know about what your audition process for the Berlin Phil was like. So maybe we could get into um, you embarking on your professional journey and how you got to where you are today. Okay. So if I just rewind then back to, um, so before the Berlin Philharmonic, when I first, when I finished my studies, the last place I studied was Paris at the Paris Conservatoire. And then I I came back to the UK and um, almost immediately afterwards, um, a vacancy came up. But what was really my local orchestra when I grew up, which was the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra which in those days was conducted by Sir Simon Rattle, who, of course, then was the music director of the Berlin Philharmonic as well. So we go back a long way. So I went and I I auditioned for that. So that was audition number one in my life. Absolutely, uh, you know, standard procedure, two rounds of auditions. And then I was offered a trial, a short trial. We just do trials in the UK often. Well, mine was only a couple of months and got the job. And then I did my, the second audition of my life was actually for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Oh, wow. And that was probably, um, well, hold on, it was, it was when John Farillo got the job. So I suppose, it, oh, I knew when it was. It was when my second daughter was born. So it was 21 years ago. When the vacancy was up, I was invited to Boston for a, um, about six weeks, I think. I played with the orchestra and I did an audition. And by that time, I'd already been in my orchestra in the UK for probably about eight years. So I had some experience. And what I noticed in that audition um, was, I mean, I was given a, a kind of a, a folder, you know, with um, a ring binder, you know, with just excerpt after excerpt. And what I really enjoyed about that audition was you were just jumping from Bach to Bartok, to Strauss. And I really um, remember thinking I was, I I could almost um, send up the whole thing, you know, by changing dramatically my mood or my style, you know, from excerpt to excerpt. And that was, that was actually rather fun. Anyway, I didn't get the job. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's fine. I had a great time when I was there. And then, um, 
And then uh, a few years later, so this is now um, about 18 years ago, um, the vacancy came up for the Berlin Film. And um, it was actually my second oboe in Birmingham, Karen O'Connor, who um, sadly died a couple of years ago. Uh, she told me, she knew that it had always been my ambition, even as a teenager, to be in the Berlin Philharmonic. And she sat me down one day at a coffee break for rehearsal and she said, now, Jonathan, you know that Hans-Jörg Schellenberger is leaving Berlin Phil, so that job's going to be up. Because none of us were expecting the vacancy to, to become free. And so it was a surprise to me. And I remember thinking, oh, now I've got to do it because that's what I'd always said I wanted to do. So it was almost my destiny was calling me. Uh, and I actually, um, I couldn't do the first um, load of auditions they scheduled because I had, you know, work commitments with my own, own orchestra. Um, so I thought, well, that's it. Uh, you know, that opportunity's passed me by, but it didn't matter. I was very happy where I was. Um, and then they didn't appoint anyone, the first lot of auditions. And so then I was invited to the next lot, load of auditions they did, which was on Friday the 13th of December, I remember. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I flew there the night before. Um, well, that was the plan. Um, so I could be ready for a 10 o'clock start in the morning. Um, from Birmingham but I had to get a connecting flight in Amsterdam and my first flight was late so I missed it and I missed the last flight to Berlin I thought oh that's not a good sign so I had to stay overnight in Amsterdam arrived at Berlin after the audition was due to start and I walked into this big dressing room filled with oboists all whizzing up and down their instruments and I just thought shall I just stop now shall I just go Christmas shopping in December um, and tell everyone I didn't get past the first round. And then I thought, no, I'll do it because, you know, I've made it now. Everything's kind of working against me. So why not? I've got nothing to lose. And so I did the audition. And, uh, well, to tell Isaiah about the process, it's, um, it's unique, I think, in that um, I was... The first round, so I walked out onto the stage of the Philharmonie and the entire orchestra was sitting. Um, so, you know, I suppose 100 or so wow. musicians. Uh, so it's a little bit like giving a recital, you know, to a, a small select group. Um, quite daunting, but at the same time, quite nice that you weren't just playing to five people, you know, a panel. And also there was no screen, so I could perform to them. And I had the whole hall, you know, I mean, the Philharmonie is this fantastic space. Um, I'd only played there once or twice, you know, with my own orchestra when I'd been there touring. So um, I had the whole, I just remember really enjoying the sound of the hall, you know, the acoustic. So anyway, that was the first round. It wasn't perfect by any stretch, but I somehow got through it. I got called back to the second round. So the first round was Mozart, obviously. Second round, Strauss. And the piano player, she was a fantastic player, but she missed out all the tutties. <laughs> so I had to jump from, you know, the first two pages of the Strauss right to the next bit. And then she jumped to the slow movement, you know, had no chance to catch my breath. <laughs> and, then, and then she jumped straight from the exposition of the slow movement to the cadenza, into the opening of the last movement and then they stopped me and uh and then there was a little round of applause i thought well, that's nice and i realize now that that's what happens you know when if, if we as an orchestra are listening to a candidate and we are enjoying their playing then we'll clap it's just it's really encouraging you know and then there was a third round and there were three of us in it there were three finalists and uh, we were all called onto the stage together and we had to play one after another, the same excerpt. So we played, um, or you could probably tell me, you know, Brahms Violin Concerto, Strauss Don Juan, the solo, and uh, Silk and Ladder. One after another. It was like a sort of penalty shootout at the end of the, mm. the soccer match. <laughs> the drama. And, uh, 
Yeah, it was a little bit. Although by then, you know, I'd already played two rounds um, and uh, the nerves had gone, you know, the adrenaline was kind of, I didn't have any left. So I just was past caring almost. And I was also fascinated to hear the other two play, you know, so, um, so then um, we were led off the stage and then there was a certain amount of, I suppose, deliberation from the orchestra. And then an announcement was made in German and I didn't speak German in those days. So I didn't actually understand that I'd got the job. And um, then all of a sudden, there were all these people walking up to me, shaking my hand <laughs> and telling me, congratulations. And I thought, oh, so I obviously got the job. And so I got it. Um, and that's not the end of the process, though, in Berlin. Then you're put on a, a trial for two years, two seasons. So um, I played in the orchestra um, on a two-year contract, which then, um, after that, you have you're voted in or out. Uh, unfortunately, I got tenure, so um, they can't get rid of me now. <laughs> well, they probably can, <laughs> but it would be difficult. <laughs> so that's it. That's a very long answer to the question. That is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. How long is your podcast? <laughs> 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 this will have to be an extended edition. <laughs> I have so many questions. I don't know where to start. Okay, I'll edit my answers. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it like to play in that orchestra? You know, I have a little bit yeah. of a, a fun intro to this question because my wife is a horn player. And when mm -hmm. I told her that we were going to talk to you, she said, ooh, I have a question. What is it like to play with the horn section? And, oh, never mind. What is it like <laughs> to play with the brass? And then I was like, what's it like to play with that orchestra? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's keep it general. <laughs> so, yeah, what is it like? And, you know, what sets that orchestra apart? This is also um, related to a question from Philip. Okay, that's a good question. And um, in answer to that, I can remember very well my very first experience of playing in the orchestra, I was, you know, obviously it was the first rehearsal of a new programme and it was not a particularly familiar piece. I think it was, maybe it was Rachmaninoff, Isle of the Dead, something like that, and Mahler, Das Klagende Lied, you know, two pieces that you maybe are not played very often. And I remember thinking, you know, as a British musician, this is a free-for-all. You know, nothing's together, everyone's playing too loud. And um, it just it just sounded to me like a, a big mixing pot. And I couldn't imagine how anything convincing could come out of it. But then over the two days of the rehearsal leading up to the concert, it just, the, the curve was extraordinary. And, and then by the time it got to the concert, it was... Um, really exciting and what I realize over time is that um, what sets the orchestra apart is that it really I mean it's a cliche but it is an orchestra of soloists so everyone from the front to the back and also the inner voices in the winds plays very soloistically which doesn't mean they all play loud but they all really pepper their own part with lots of there's lots of seasoning you know it's very active and you can you can all, almost if you if you see the orchestra perform you can you can tell because mm -hmm. of the movement and um uh and animation everyone is is really playing in a very active manner and that can lead sometimes to things perhaps not being perfectly together which is we don't see that necessarily as a as a negative um it sort of informs our sound as well like we also d don't always try to get chords perfectly together you know so you realize over the years that that there's a culture which when you first join it you think what and then as and then as you get used to it you realize how um beneficial it is and also it makes it i think easier to play in because you you're surrounded by sound and activity and you never feel exposed 
uh, or sort of stuck out on your own, you know, it's, um, which of course on the oboe is not a nice feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, it's always very, uh, yeah, very exciting, I have to say. It sounds like you and the whole orchestra do not experience the negativity of perfectionism in Absolutely a way not. that I think we do here in the United States uh, in mm -hmm. a lot of cases. We really emphasize being perfect and not making, mis making mistakes. And, and it, what you're saying is that, that it's okay if something is not absolutely perfect, if it is musical. And, and, and you, you also express that in your uh, story about winning the job. So could you speak a little mm -hmm. bit about or speak to people who are struggling with perfectionism and how to balance that, yeah. um, wanting to be accurate uh, and true to the music while also being yourself? Sure. Well, um, you, you're absolutely right that the um, in our orchestra, um, people, well, there's no, there is no... F atmosphere you know if somebody makes a mistake so there's no feeling of sort of punishment or judgment because as I explained you know everyone is playing their part with a sort of a hundred percent commitment and animation that means that normally if something goes wrong it's because it's going wrong for the right reasons okay. it's going wrong because you're you're trying to really risk pianissimo or you want to make a really soft attack and when that happens, nobody bats an eyelid. Nobody even really notices. Um, and the other thing, of course, and you learn this, is that from the outside anyway, little mistakes hardly get noticed. Right. Uh, when you're playing to be perfect, that's when you start making the really awful mistakes, you know, right. I think, because your intention is wrong. And so, I mean, I... I what I sometimes say to, to, to students uh, or even to myself, I remind myself what my driving instructor said to me years and years ago when I was obviously doing something wrong. He said, look, if you don't, if you don't want to n knock into something, then don't look at it. Look at where you want to go. Mm. And that's exactly the same, the psychology, when you're on stage. If you're thinking to yourself, oh, I really want to get this. I really want to get this articulation right or I'm really worried that this A is going to be out of tune when I come in or something or I think I'm going to squeak or the notes are, is that I really hope the note doesn't speak whereas instead if you think obviously in positive terms it's very basic psychology but if you if you think about what you how you want it to be or how it could be yeah not like oh I want it to be like this but just this could be a lovely soft entry yeah rather than, oh, I hope I don't bash the beginning of this note. But then th the other thing is, and I think this comes from having supportive colleagues in the orchestra, is not beating yourself up when uh, something does go wrong. And of course it does. I mean, you know, of course it does. But, you know, in this world, in this life, we can't be perfect. And at some stage you have to realise that, otherwise you, you can't mature as a person, can you? And, or as a musician either, if you're... I mean, why do we play music? We don't play to show how good we are. We play to convey the message, bring alive the, the message that the composer wrote, don't we? So you have to always think about your intention. And then, you know, if something goes wrong, you think, well, that's because I'm not perfect. Almost enjoy not being perfect. Obviously, the perfection thing is also really hard when it comes to auditions. Mm -hmm. But if I just refer back to that, what I was saying, what I noticed when I did the Boston Symphony audition was that I really enjoyed the juxtaposition of these really different characters. So to play the solos from Das Lied von der Erde and then suddenly a Haydn symphony. You know, so you, I wasn't thinking about the oboe. I was thinking about the different characters of the, of the excerpts. And I think that's another thing. If you can distract your mind by getting into the story of the music, then you'll get to the end of the concert and think, oh, I didn't even think once about that thing I was worried about. I mean, it's easier said than done. I realise that. But um, you have to, I think, with contemplation or meditation or or even it just in your practice you have to control your thoughts and think so what am I thinking about am I thinking oh you know I'm playing this really well 
or am I thinking actually about the intention of the of the music? You know, train the brain. <laughs> In in a in I get not in a way, but really you're in you're bringing in your right brain more. We we tend to yes. be very left brained, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When we're trying to be perfect, but bringing in the artist side. Exactly, and of course nowadays there's there's so much more help with that sort of thing. You know, in training yourself to um, to do that. You know, from the realm of sports psychology, then a lot of musicians have taken that now and and coach. And I would say that people should definitely avail themselves of that. But the other thing is, I think people shouldn't look at, you know, students or young players shouldn't look at professionals and think, well, they're okay, you know, because, because they're not, you know, I mean, we all, we all have to um, deal with that, you know, because it's a natural thing to feel, um, to feel vulnerable on the stage. But once you, um, once you accept that, I think, well, actually, I want to be vulnerable because then I'm a more touching musician. Mm-hmm. Then, then you don't have to beat yourself up about it because if you're thinking, I mustn't feel vulnerable, I must, I must, be, I must be invincible, then you just won't be. We're both like, yeah, uh, like just absorbing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to write about this in my journal later. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Alfonso would like to know, what differences do you note between um, playing under Simon Rattle as a principal conductor in comparison to Kirill Petrenko? Oh, um, gosh, so many. Um, but to put it into words is very hard. I mean, in the end, yeah, I think when you're at this at that level, of conducting and musicianship in the end there's i mean it's true in life isn't it that you play as you are as a person you can never escape who you are and and simon and kirill are very different people and so of course their musical personalities are very different too um in terms of how they work oh gosh that's also very different it's very hard to compare them i would just say obviously it's early days with kirill petrenko um, I love how he prepares us. He he prepares meticulously with the orchestra. So we work and work and work to the last minute and sometimes beyond the last minute of rehearsal to get small details right. Uh, and then in the concert, he comes on stage and you have the impression like none of that matters anymore. Let's just let's just go on a magical journey which is fantastic. Uh, To contrast that with Simon, uh, Simon also works very methodically in a different way. And with him, you feel he he employs a lot of humour, in a lot of sort of crazy humour in rehearsals. It's quite entertaining. And then you feel um, playing for him. He Obviously, he, he beats and all that kind of stuff in a completely different way to Petrenko so you read you read him I read him differently with Simon I I I read it much more well I guess the thing is to answer that question it's so hard because I've worked with Simon now for 25 years and so I almost don't even really um well I I watch him but I kind of watch his aura, <laughs> you know, I get his, um, his mood. I can tell what he wants through a kind of ESP. With Petrenko, I, I, what I love about it is it's so clear what he wants and his, um, his honesty and integrity shines through um, in the performance so much that that inspires me. Now that's not really, I can't really contrast the two because they're they're so different. I would say, look and find out for yourself, you know, um, but they are both um, really wonderful musicians to work with because they are both very self-deprecating. They're not into the whole maestro thing. I get very turned off by that. So I want to play my best for both of them. 
you know that that's what they give to me whereas there are some conductors who make me almost feel uncooperative or you know i just think oh why do you have to be like that and then i and then i'm not in the mood to play well for them you know then i have to make myself and i have to be professional whereas for petrenko and simon raffle i just i just want to play you know well, Dylan also has a question that we'll ask you to compare. Uh, he wants to know any noticeable differences in oboe pedagogy that you've observed. And he specifies Germany and the UK, but as someone who gives master classes all around the world, I would just be interested in your perspective on uh, different regional approaches to oboe playing and what you've noticed. Well, of course, when I go around um, and experience, you know, other other players and other students and things, I'm teaching them. So <laughs> I'm just imposing my pedagogy right. on them when I give a master class. So I don't really see many other teachers teaching. Um, however, obviously, I can um, glean a certain amount from working with the students, and I can see that uh, some maybe. You know, some oboist in in a particular class um, might have um, you know a particular approach to holding the reed or or you know a particular way of holding the instrument very high or very low all that sort of thing. Um, but I think that's more to just to do with the individual um, quirks of the teacher. So I find that difficult really to um, to answer. Again, because because uh, I just don't see other people teach, but but I certain I still see differences. Na you know, everyone says that the national the differences between the national styles uh, are sort of morphing together. I still see huge differences in style, and I enjoy that. So if I were giving a class um, in Japan, or if I was giving a class in in the US. Um, I would just enjoy that and the different sort of um, way they play and not try to change it. Um, I, you know, I like to respect those, those differences. Um, I, do, I do teach every year at the Pacific Music Festival um, where we often have a real mix of players from all around the world. And I love that, seeing American players um, conversing with British and German and Japanese and Korean you know, and comparing their sounds and, you know, how they hold the instrument, that's really fascinating because then you see an experience really close to actually the real differences between the schools. Um, but, yeah, sure, I mean, of course, there's an enormous difference between um, an American player and a, a, a German player. Um, but I think that's, that is, uh, yeah, it's down to individual teachers, but also, you know, the, the players themselves, the students themselves. Not a very good answer, but, you know. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I wonder if you have any stories from being on tour or fun memories that you'd like to share of being on tour with the Berlin Philharmonic. Oh, we're very serious. We don't have fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh! Well, I can't really think of any particular sort of fun, funny things at the moment. Uh, hold, up. we do have an enormous amount of fun on tour and on stage as well. There's quite often a lot of joking about. I do remember once when I was on tour, not with um, Berlin, but with my former orchestra, and it was at that point where they they were introducing those, you know, those. Um, acoustic screens you know to protect people's hearing and and we were this so this was quite a long time ago and we were on tour in japan i think it was and um <laughs> and the viola players in front of us in front of the oboes decided they wanted to try out the acoustic screens so um we uh we had them placed in front of us for the concert we'd never tried anything like that before and so I was playing away. I don't, can't remember what the piece was. And then I became aware that I could actually see the face of the second oboist reflected, <laughs> <laughs> reflected in, the, in the glass screen in front of me. And then she realised at the same time. So then 
<laughs> when, and she was quite a joker. So then when um, I was playing a solo or something and she had a few buzzers, she'd start pulling very subtle but very noticeable faces <laughs> <laughs> to com- as if to sort of comment on how I was playing. And, and it got to the point where actually I, could, I was trying so hard not to laugh, I could hardly form an embouchure. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the conductor was sort of looking and he was thinking why is this oboist who's trying to play I don't know what solo having a fit of giggles but um, <laughs> that was something I always think of now when I see we don't actually use those acoustic screens in our orchestra um, but um, but whenever I see them I always think back to that for sure <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it was really distracting. (laughs) So when you were talking about touring and not having any fun, it reminded me of reed making. And Uh, I was wondering what your relationship is to reed making um, in the, you know, in the regular season and being on tour. And how do you manage balancing all of that? Okay, so um, I thrive on just being very systematic which for me just means if I put in the hours I know I'll have something so in other words I don't tend to do um, you know a huge batch and then sort of hope that will last me Um, I I just always have a drip feed of reeds going through the system all through the season so um, I every week will you know be tying on a few and I'll have a few that I will be, you know, scraping or profiling and then putting to one side. So I just keep it going as sort of a, a little and often and very, very regularly. And then when we go on tour, normally um, I will take with me, uh, you know, I have a few that I'm thinking I'll use those. But I will also take some which I have um, profiled but not finished off and I will, even if I think I've got sufficient reads, I will always spend, you know, a bit of time just tweaking the ones which are in reserve, um, just so that I know there's always something, just in case something should happen. Uh, so, yeah, uh, um, a little and often is is um, normally my mantra for read making. Andrea wants to know uh, if you'll tell us about your favorite concert with the Berlin Phil. Well, the last concert I did, well, the, no, the one before the last, but the last concert I did before we were shut down, that's right, <laughs> because of the coronavirus, um, I played Strauss Obu Concerto mm. with Simon Rattle conducting. So that was quite a high point. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really glad I managed to get that concert done before they decided to close the concert. Right, good timing. Yeah, then the next concert we played was to an empty hall. Mm. Um, And then they even, that was even shut down after that. So we're not even doing that anymore. But that was obviously great. But what else? Oh, gosh, you know, so many wonderful concerts. I've been so privileged because I got to play, you know, with Bernard Heitink and Hanon Kaur and Claudio Abado. (sighs) Bernard Heitink is one of my very favorite conductors and the last few years every time he came before he finally decided to retire we all wondered if this might be his last concert so all of those last concerts were incredibly special because there was such a a bond and I just you know I always admired him so much in terms of uh, pieces you know which pieces I particularly really really enjoy playing um, what I've really enjoyed since joining the Berlin Phil is learning the Wagner operas. I've never really played any Wagner operas until I joined the Berlin Phil. And we're not an opera orchestra, but we do stage an opera every year. And we did the whole ring cycle um, oh, many years ago now. And quite recently we did Tristan and Isolde. Now that's a great opera for the oboe. I mean, it, you know, the, the oboe gets all the best bits um, and also Parsifal has beautiful parts for the episode. So those have been real, real high points. It is such a, an event playing in the orchestra that almost at the end of every concert, you think, oh, that was just great. That was the best one. You know, that's something you never take for granted. You know, it really is. It really is always a special occasion. It never feels um, run of the mill, humdrum. 
Are there any embarrassing memories from the stage that you would be willing to share with us that are listeners? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, <laughs> painfully, uh, pa painfully embarrassing was um, one of the very first times I came back to the UK to play in the proms at the Royal Albert Hall. That's right. With when so I just I. I'd started in the Berlin Phil and we were on tour. That's right. And we played back in the UK and we did Stravinsky, The Rite of Spring. And um, then Simon Rattle decided to program as an encore the uh, Sati Gymnopédie, the one which starts on an A and then sort of floats down towards the C and then rises up again. Very quiet, very exposed, very beautiful, if it works. Um, so we did... The right of spring. Of course, you know, with the right of spring, you can hardly hear yourself play most of the time. And there was very strong air conditioning blowing down on the instrument. And I got a lot of water lodged in the uh, tone hole that makes C. And I was sort of blowing it out. But um, at the end of the um, right of spring, then I thought, oh, it's probably okay. I did the pull through and everything. And then we started the encore. <clears throat> And so um, a very hushed atmosphere, the strings and the harp started playing and I, I managed to you know, float a lovely top A and then came gradually legato down to a C, which came out as a B. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I played a C, and it does come quite often in that solo, it would come out as a B and not even, I mean, just also just like a really lame sounding B as well. And it really was just awful. And I couldn't, I just, I was trying different fingerings and nothing was working. And it was terrific. I wanted, I wanted the, um, I wanted the earth to open up and swallow me at that stage. But, you know, it was just one moment in time. Uh, fortunately, we'd done it also for the, the dress rehearsal that afternoon. So for the radio, um, they could do an edit. But at that particular moment, I was really, really embarrassed. And the other one was what... <laughs> the other one, which was quite recent, was um, we were doing Beethoven 9 and the slow movement. Um, it was live on television and the internet. And um, we got to a point, oh, you know, the slow movement of Beethoven 9 is quite tiring um, for the oboe. And there are points where you're sort of, um, I think that's right, we were, we were, we'd landed on a chord and the conductor was holding the chord extra long. And I suddenly realized I had a nosebleed. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that and, you know, it just happened suddenly and um, I knew the camera would be on me and Emmanuel Pahu because we were just the only two playing pretty much <laughs> and my nose was streamed like, and then it started dripping <laughs> onto the front of my shirt and so then I played the rest of the Beethoven line I looked like a horror film <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so that was a special moment Oh my god. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking that's probably like the most interesting celebration of his 250th anniversary that has gone on worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why is the principal elbow is bleeding from his face? <laughs> All over his shirt and bow tie. It really wasn't very nice. <laughs> It's horrible, really horrible. But of course, when I was playing at the time, I thought, well, do I stop and sort of wipe my nose? I, I thought I can't because then, you know, it was just me and the flute. So I had to just let it. <laughs> what advice do you have for a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours? I would say definitely keep sight of your dreams. Um, I mean, I've really... When I was a teenager, I did tell everyone I wanted to be in the Berlin Philharmonic. And that was, um, that remained my dream. But I would say, be, re be realistic about it in terms of, um, well, prepare. For, prepare correctly, f you know, in order to let, to let your dream come true. In other words, 
I um, always wanted to be in the Berlin Phil, so I always listened to their recordings. I mean, I really knew how all the oboists in the sort of recorded history of the orchestra sounded. And I suppose I modelled my, my concept of the sound and all that sort of thing pretty much on what I heard. I mean, at the same time, obviously developing my own personality and that sort of thing. But I often, I'm often surprised sometimes by people when they perhaps do an audition that they might come in and play in a manner completely unsuited to our orchestra. And, and I think to myself, well, you're playing really, really well, but have you ever listened to how, uh, you know, we play? You know, so, so I would say target yourself, you know, according to what you want to do, what you want to be. Yeah, that would be my first piece of advice, which I guess is, the, you know, it's kind of live your dreams sort of advice or go for it advice. My second piece of advice would be um, be consistent in everything that you do. So if you work consistently and regularly, then um, it should never be really hard work. You know, you don't have to, I would say, you don't have to practice for hours and hours at a time sort of thing, but you do have to be very consistent and you, you should really go at things until you've really got them right. And the other thing I would say is be your own best teacher. <clears throat> um, really, the best teacher you can have is, your, is yourself. It, it's your ears and also your eyes looking in the mirror analy or filming what you're doing, analyzing you know, how your technique is going. And think of technique not in terms of racing around the instrument, but in terms of honing your playing, honing the way you play down into being the most efficient machine possible. So um, I refer, I sort of call that oboe gym, you know, when I'm teaching, go to oboe gym every day. And so keep that separate from your music almost with your scales and things. So be consistent with scales as well. So really the, the best way to do that is not to wait for a teacher to tell you, but to actually work it out yourself um, and think to yourself when you're practicing, what would my teacher say or what would I say if I was giving myself a lesson here? You know, so always ask yourself those kind of questions and be analytical of your own playing. You know, um, there was a wonderful quote of Ray Still, you know, from Chicago Symphony. Mm -hmm. He said years ago, he said, I think there's a lot of, I think when people practice the oboe, there's a lot of wishful thinking going on. Mm -hmm. you know, in other words, you're playing, but you're not really listening to yourself. And I think the way to get really good is to really listen and really analyze what you're doing and for me you know the fact that for the last 10 or so years all our concerts have been recorded and uh, are put into an archive of the digital concert hall that's also been a great teacher for me because I can listen back and work out what isn't you know, here, what's not working, and just constantly tweak and try and improve. So never lose that, um, never lose that sort of hunger to improve. Well, I can't think of a better way to spend an hour. Jonathan Kelly, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. We are so delighted to talk to you, and we just really appreciate you spending the time with us today. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. So that was an amazing interview. Thank you so much for joining us for that. As always, you can find us on our social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and you can listen to us on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and everything, I think. So just go ahead and subscribe wherever you are. And if you like us, give us a nice little five-star review and a little blurb on iTunes just because it makes us feel happy. Jackie, who do we have next coming up on Double Read Dish? Next episode, we will feature an interview with Whitney, Whitney, Whitney Crockett. Crockett. <laughs> 
Principal Bassoon of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. We could not resist. <laughs> Jackie, it's time to end this nerd parade. Oh, my greed. <laughs>